Thank you all for your patience. And I pass it over to our wonderful patient and family resource coordinator, Amy. Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to the Hirschberg Foundation for Pancreatic Cancer Research webinar, Cannabis Components and Cancer, What We Know and Where We're Headed. My name is Amy Reese and I'm the Patient and Family Support Coordinator for the Foundation. I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of our wonderful sponsors who help make these webinars possible. And as Alyssa mentioned, uh, stick around for survivor chat once webinar ends and uh, we'll stop recording, give everyone the space to share stories, information and ask each other questions. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ziva Cooper, the director of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative and the Jane and Terry Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. Her current research involves understanding variables that influence both the therapeutic potential and adverse effects of cannabis and cannabinoids. This is one of the first university programs focused on the multidisciplinary study of cannabis with experts from diverse fields brought together to advance the understanding of the plant's impact on body, brain, and society. Dr. Cooper, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really an honor to be here. To Aggie, thank you so much for inviting me to speak to your group and for Amy and Elisa for helping to set this up. It's really, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to, to be here today. Um, and just as an introduction, I want to let the audience know that I am a scientist. Uh, my training is in understanding the behavioral and biological effects of psychoactive substances. And about 13 years ago, I started concentrating on cannabis and cannabinoids. And like Amy said, um, I was really interested in um, understanding the therapeutic effects as well as adverse effects, because as you'll soon learn, we have very little data in this area, despite the fact that so many people in the United States and across the globe are using cannabis for medical and non-medical purposes. So I am not an oncologist um, and I am not a physician, I am a scientist. And so I'm going to give you a perspective of the state of the research from a scientist's perspective. And it's going to be a whirlwind tour of what is cannabis, what is the evidence for its therapeutic effects and how does this pertain to cancer patients and cancer symptoms? And of course, I'll also touch upon the potential adverse effects um, and important um, patient considerations that we should th be thinking about. So with that, I'll go ahead and share my slides. Okay. So I'll be talking about cannabis components and cancer, what we know and where we're headed. Um, and I always let people know where my scientific and research funding comes from. So it's mostly from the NIH. I do get some funding from the California State Center of Medicinal Cannabis Research. And in fact, I'll be sharing with you a study that we have coming up that is funded by this um, CMCR, the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. So a brief overview, I'll talk about the changing landscape and history of cannabis and cannabinoids, specifically in the United States. And then I'll be sharing with you the actual evidence that we have supporting the therapeutic effects of cannabis for cancer and cancer-related symptoms, patient considerations, and where we're going at UCLA to help fill this gap in knowledge that you'll see is pretty significant. So I want to go back in history about 2,500 years ago um, to the Ice Maiden. The Ice Maiden was found in 1993 as a mummy um, in the mountains of Russia. And in 1993, she was found very, very well preserved. Um, but she was, it was indicated that it looked like at the time that she died, she was malnourished and she actually had, um, she was buried with a bag of cannabis. It was recognized or investigated and later to be determined cannabis. And a couple of years later, um, some archeologists and scientists did an MRI scan and they found that she actually had breast cancer when she died. And so this was an early suggestion that perhaps even 2,500 years ago, 
people were using cannabis for cancer. So fast forward several thousands of years, um, and we see how cannabis was brought to Western medicine. And this was done by Dr. William O'Shaughnessy. Um, and in the 1900s, we saw that medical cannabis was available for many indications over the counter. You can see here a cough syrup that had alcohol, cannabis, as well as a little morphine. Um, and what was interesting is that, you know, these were used widely that was accepted to be a treatment in Western medicine for a variety of conditions. A couple of decades later, we had the Marijuana Tax Act um, that was introduced by Harry Antlinger, Antlinger. And the Marijuana Tax Act essentially taxed cannabis for medical use at $1 an ounce, which was very significant for that time. And for recreational use, it was $100 per ounce. Um, in 1942, the can cannabis was removed from the US pharmacopoeia. And then in 1970, um, Nixon placed cannabis um, on the Controlled Substances Act as a Schedule I substance. And the Schedule I substances are essentially um, uh, drugs that have no therapeutic value and have high abuse liability and negative effects. And so you can see here, this is what the Controlled Substance Act looked like. Um, and you can see that cannabis or marijuana with the uh, red arrow was placed with hallucinogenic substances that were placed in the Schedule One category, which included LSD and DMT, peyote, mescaline, and psilocybin, um, as well as it wasn't just marijuana, but it was also tetrahydrocannabinols. So some of the chemical components in the cannabis plant that had already been identified by researchers. And I'll talk about some of these tetrahydrocannabinols. Um, so what that meant is that by putting cannabis on the Schedule I category, it indicated that it had no therapeutic use. Now, what's interesting is that despite the fact that it was put on as a Schedule I substance, the NIH and industry actually did a fair amount of research into cannabis and the chemical constituents in the 1970s and 1980s. And this research led to FDA approval of some of these constituents in the cannabis plant. Now, the drugs that were approved weren't actually from the cannabis plant, they were synthetically derived, but the chemical composition was identical to what was in the plant. So even though cannabis was schedule one, we did see research being pushed forward despite these harsh federal regulations, which even today impede research. So you fast forward to today, and what do we see? Even though cannabis is still federally illegal, it is still Schedule One. You can see that the map of the United States is, or the majority of it is green. The green states indicate some level of legal regulation of cannabis. The light green indicates can that cannabis is legal in that state for medicinal reasons. And the dark green indicates states that have regulation for cannabis that is both medicinal and non-medicinal, what is called adult use. So again, even though cannabis is still federally illegal, the majority of the people in the United, living in the United States have access to this plant, either for medicinal or adult use reasons. Now, this may not come as a surprise to you, um, but we know that cancer patients are using cannabis. And this was a survey that was actually done a couple of years ago. And I'm sure that if the survey was done now, we would see even more people using cannabis. Um, it was a survey done in Washington state. At the time that the survey was done, Washington state had both legalized cannabis for medicinal as well as adult use. So it was widely available to patients. Um, and you can see here, that at, out of the um, patients survey, 25% said they had used cannabis for the past in the past year. And the conditions that they were using it for were physical symptoms to help treat pain and nausea and appetite, to help with stress and depression, to help with sleep. And interestingly, about a third of these patients were using it to treat cancer. So today I'm going to talk about the evidence that we have 
for cannabis to be able to help with these indications that people are using cannabis for, including the potential for cannabis to treat cancer. In other words, to have anti-tumor effects. So we hear a lot about the medicinal effects of cancer, of cannabis. We hear that it could potentially help with PTSD and depression. We hear that cannabis might be helpful for age-related disorders. This is especially relevant given the fact that people over the age of 50 are the fastest group of people who are initiating cannabis use. We hear that cannabis might be helpful in digging us out of this opioid epidemic. So perhaps cannabis might be a novel strategy to help with pain. And of course, we're also hearing that cannabis might potentially cure cancer or might potentially have anti-tumor effect. So again, today I'm going to show you the evidence, how much evidence we have and you know, where we see the future of this research. So there are actually over 700 hypothesized indications for cannabis to be used as a medicine. And you'll notice here, I've only, I was only able to put 68 of these indications on this slide, but many of them are related to cancer symptomatology, right? We have appetite stimulation, depression, cancer pain, insomnia, pain, neuropathy. And so again, what is the evidence here that cannabis might be helpful? And before we talk about the evidence, I think it's really important that we first talk about cannabis itself. What is cannabis? Um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview. It is not extraordinarily detailed, but it's just to give you a sense of what this cannabis plant is like and what we're talking about when we talk about cannabis or cannabis-based therapeutics. So we know that cannabis has unique chemicals and these are called phytocannabinoids. Unique meaning that no other plant naturally has these chemicals unless they are genetically modified. So the cannabis plant has over 140 of these unique constituents. We know the most about this constituent called Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. And this was the compound that was studied the most back in the 1980s and turned out to be FDA approved in the mid 1980s. We know that tetrahydrocannabinol is helpful for some conditions. For instance, it can help increase appetite. It can help to decrease nausea. It can help to decrease pain under certain circumstances. And we know this based off of not just animal studies, but we know this from lots of double-blind placebo-controlled studies. Double-blind placebo-controlled studies is really the gold standard when we're trying to determine if a drug is helpful for indications. We study it in a population and we compare the active drug, for instance, here, it would be THC, and we compare it to a placebo and we give it to a patient population and they don't know if they're getting the placebo or if they're getting the active medication. And so there've been a lot of studies specifically with THC. Now, even though we know that THC is therapeutic for a number of indications, we also know that it does have some adverse effects. For example, when people use cannabis and they get high or intoxicated, this is because of the THC. We also know that it can have some cognitive effects immediately after its use. And it can also be abused and it can um, elicit dependence, meaning that if people use it frequently enough and then they stop abruptly, they can experience some withdrawal symptoms. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Another cannabinoid that we hear a lot about these days is cannabidiol, CBD. And CBD has become increasingly more popular in the industry and in patients because unlike THC, it is not intoxicating. It's not intoxicating and it's thought based on a lot of animal studies to have quite a number of therapeutic effects. And so we think that if it's not intoxicating and doesn't have these debilitating effects on memory or attention, and it can have these therapeutic effects that perhaps it's going to be a really safe effect and effective medication. But even though CBD is all over the place, we actually don't have so many of those placebo controlled studies looking at if CBD is effective for all the indications that people are using it. Relevant to cancer and cancer symptoms, 
There have been studies looking at CBD's effects in anxiety, a handful of studies, and they have been encouraging. There have been studies looking at CBD's effects when it's given with THC and its ability to help with pain. As of now, there haven't been very many studies looking at CBD by itself for pain, which is curious given that a lot of people are using CBD by itself for pain. There are a number of other cannabinoids that are popping up that you might actually be hearing about in the media or if you were to go to a dispensary that are starting to pique people's curiosity. And here are just a couple. There's CBDV and CBN. CBN is, thoughtful, is thought to really help with sleep. And then one of note that I just want to call your attention to, again, CBD and THC is the, one with the, the ones with the most studies being done. CBG is really interesting, especially with respect to cancer sym symptomatology, because it's thought in animals to not be intoxicating like THC. It's also been shown to decrease pain, increase appetite similar to THC, and perhaps um, help with depression-like effects. And just a couple of weeks ago, actually, there was a study looking at this molecule called CBG and its potential anti-tumor effects. Now, what's interesting is that as far as I know, there has not been a single study of this drug, of this compound in humans yet. And so this is a really low hanging fruit that we're really interested in here. In addition to these phytocannabinoids, there are a couple of other different classes of compounds in the cannabis plant that aren't unique to the cannabis plant. They're shared with other you know, fruits and vegetables and other plants. But it's thought that some of these constituents also might have therapeutic effects. And one group of these constituents are called terpenes. And there are over a hundred different terpenes in the cannabis plant. And it's thought that these terpenes by themselves might have therapeutic effects. And it's also thought that they might interact with these cannabinoids that I just showed previously to have an increased um, therapeutic value and maybe decrease some of the negative effects. And so here are five that are really interesting, especially two up above, beta caryophylline and myrcene, which are the focus of one of our studies. Both beta caryophylline and myrcene are also thought to help to reduce pain. And there's quite a bit of literature in the animal studies demonstrating that they might be helpful. Again, this hasn't been studied yet in humans, and we're hoping to do those studies at UCLA. So we have all these different components of the cannabis plant and how do people use cannabis and these different constituents. And I'm sure that most of you know, you know, lots of different methods. Um, of course, we have the smoked method, which is definitely not new or novel. People can smoke cannabis as a joint with cigarette paper. They can smoke cannabis as a blunt where you hollow out a cigar and you use that tobacco leaf. Um, to, to use as a vehicle for the cannabis um, smoking. Topicals are becoming really popular now, all types of topicals, salves and lotions. Now people are starting to vaporize their cannabis use. And what you can see in the top part of that middle column is a volcano vaporizer that's actually approved for therapeutic use in Europe and Canada and Israel. And what this does is that it heats up the plant material, the cannabis plant material to a temperature where the cannabis does not combust, but where the chemicals in the cannabis plant vaporize. And so it's thought to help reduce the respiratory risk that's associated with smoking with the combustion. And then we have vape pens that usually use these cartridges that have these cannabis products in them. And we know that edible products are becoming increasingly more popular for people who like chocolate or baked goods and those who prefer, you know, the Mediterranean palate. We have the pistachio encrusted baklava. In addition to these emerging trends, we also have a robust industry in CBD where you can, you can get CBD infused food, CBD infused pillowcases, as you can see on that bottom square. If you go to overstock.com, you can get yourself a CBD infused pillowcase for $60, CBD infused athletic wear. And the idea is that when you sweat, the CBD comes off of the athletic wear and permeates your muscles and perhaps um, improves your, um, your recovery time. You can get CBD in capsules and CBD in droppers. 
And then we have all these other cannabinoids that are becoming popular, CBN, CBG, CBXYZ. And we're starting to see these products available in all different forms, especially in Los Angeles, where there's a significant industry. So we have all these different ways that people are using these products. And we also know that cannabis itself is changing over time. So we know that the amount of THC, again, that intoxicating component of the cannabis plant has been increasing over the years. So what you can see here is from 1995 to 2014, the amount of THC in cannabis has increased um, by about threefold. So from 4% to about 12%. And if you go further out to 2017, we're still seeing this increase. Now, keep in mind for people that go to dispensaries, you know that you can get cannabis with higher amounts of THC, even up to 30% THC. So this is just a snapshot of, um, this is actually seized cannabis from the unregulated market, not from the regulated dispensaries that you, that you frequent, that people might frequent in Los Angeles. Now, what are some of the issues that come about with the state regulation? We have all these different emerging trends. One issue is the fact that there really is very little regulation around these products. Um, and so I'm going to show you some data from about five years ago where uh, a group of researchers took edibles from three different cities and they compared the labels of these edibles um, to what was actually inside of that product. Um, so they, they tested all these products to see the accuracy of the labels. And what they found was that only 17% of these products were accurately labeled and 23% were under labeled, um, meaning that the products had more THC in them than what was in the label. Now, what was surprising or shocking at the time was that most the most under labeled products were actually in Los Angeles. Now, what I wanna point out is that Los Angeles now and California in general has very stringent quality control standards where the dispensaries that are regulated, they have to maintain a certain level of quality and they have to test their products now. And so now in Los Angeles, if you go to a regulated dispensary, you can be assured that the products that you're getting that the label reflects what is in those products. But it's something that I'm going to talk about a little bit later that I think is important when we think about patient considerations. So those are the THC products. And what about the CBD products? What, what some researchers found was that for the CBD products, 70% of them were mislabeled. So they had more or less CBD in those products and over 20% had THC in them. THC levels that could be detected. And so this is a concern because if you're a patient and you're getting CBD rather than THC, because you don't want necessarily the potential adverse effects of intoxication, potential impact on memory or attention, and you're getting a CBD product that has THC in it, it kind of defeats the purpose of your choice. Um, so these findings demonstrate the real need for regulation, but the actual lack of a federal regulatory framework right now. So it's really kind of the wild west, at least in California. Again, there are pretty stringent measures here um, within the regulated dispensaries. But keep in mind that in Los Angeles, for example, only 20% of the dispensaries in Los Angeles are regulated. The other 80% are not regulated. And so it's important to know when you go into a dispensary, if it's regulated or unregulated. So now that we know what cannabis is, let's talk about the data pointing to the potential that cannabis and cannabinoids might be effective therapeutics for cancer and cancer symptomatology. So I'm going to talk a little bit about an experience I had um, about four years ago, I was invited to participate with the National Academies of Sciences. They gathered together a group of 16 experts and we put together a consensus statement. It was a 450 page book that essentially summarized all the data related to the therapeutic effects of cancer, of cannabis and cannabinoids, as well as the adverse effects of cannabis, of cannabis and cannabinoids. It was a huge undertaking, but what was gleaned from that report 
was a really solid sense of where we are with respect to the knowledge of the negative and therapeutic effects of cannabis and cannabinoids. Out of that 450 page book, only 50 pages were dedicated to the therapeutic effects of cannabis and cannabinoids. The other 400 or 350 were dedicated to the adverse effects simply because we just don't have that many studies done in this space yet. So I'm going to share with you what our conclusions are and how they pertain to cancer symptomatology. So we looked at the 20 most qualifying conditions um, for, that people can get cannabis in states that have medical cannabis laws. And what you can see here of these 20 common qualifying conditions, many of them are associated with cancer symptomatology. We have anxiety, chemotherapy associated nausea and vomiting, chronic pain, depression, sleep. So I'm going to share with you the data that we found here. And what we found was that there was substantial evidence supporting the use of cannabis and cannabinoids for chemotherapy associated nausea, vomiting, and anorexia, um, as well as HIV associated anorexia and cachexia. We also found that there was substantial evidence supporting the use of cannabis and cannabinoids for chronic pain. Now that conclusion was based off of 40 placebo controlled studies. So again, 40 rigorous studies where patients were given placebo or the active medication, the gold standard. And five of these studies were done with cancer pain. Three of these studies actually had positive findings demonstrating that with some of the outcomes, these cancer patients had relief from their pain with the cannabis or cannabinoid product that was being explored in that particular study. Now, one thing that's important to note that, that will be coming up frequently is that zero of these studies were done with dispensary product. So they, none of these studies were done with a product that you can get in the dispensaries in Westwood and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Maryland, DC, wherever you're calling from. They were all done with pharmaceutical grade um, cannabis products with some exceptions and I'll talk about that. In addition to those indications that we found substantial evidence supporting the use of cannabis and cannabinoids, we now know that since this publication, 2017, there's been quite a bit of um, data looking at the use of CBD for anxiety. Um, and I will say that, you know, we have a far way to go with respect to really understanding CBD's effects on, on anxiety but there definitely demonstrates some promise um, for CBD to be helpful for anxiety. Now, again, overwhelmingly, these studies were not done with the cannabis plant. They were done with these preparations from the cannabis plant or from synthetic drugs. And I'll talk more about this in a minute. And zero of these studies were done with dispensary product. So if they weren't done with dispensary product and they weren't done with the cannabis plant, what drugs were used in these studies to demonstrate the effectiveness of cannabis and cannabinoids. So they were actually done, a lot of them were done in the 1980s, if you can believe it. It's been decades you know, since these studies have been done and they were mostly done with these FDA approved medications that are synthetic and THC-like. Um, so most of these studies were done, many of you might know about dronabinol, which is a synthetic THC and it comes in a pill form and a liquid form. Another drug is nabilone or sesamet, which is THC-like, also synthetic. The only FDA approved cannabinoid that is plant derived is called Epidiolex. And this was approved in 2018. So it took several decades from when dronabinol and nabilone were approved to get approval for a totally different type of drug, a CBD drug from the plant itself, not synthetically derived. And I'm going to tell you about the FDA approval of dronabinol, nablone, and epidiolex, because I think it's very relevant. Um, so again, in the 1980s, dronabinol, um, marinol, which is the pill form of that synthetic THC, was FDA approved for two um, cancer-related symptoms, chemotherapy-induced nausea and um, appetite suppression. Now, I want you to just take note of the doses that are used here. 
um, where the doses here are two and a half to 10 milligrams of THC, which might be quite different to what's available in dispensaries. There are um, now some restrictions on how many milligrams of THC can be in a brownie or a cookie or a pill, but in some states there aren't these restrictions. Um, and there might be a lot more than 10 milligrams of THC in that oral product. There have also been studies with this drug looking at its effects on pain. Another form of the synthetic THC, dronabinol, is a liquid form. It's called Syndros, which is also approved for chemotherapy-induced nausea and um, appetite suppression. Um, and yet another one that was also approved back in the 1980s, which is a THC-like drug, also approved for, chemo for chemotherapy-induced nausea. And there have been some studies looking at this drug for pain, although, no although not in cancer pain. And then next, we have the only FDA-approved drug that comes from the plant, that comes from the cannabis plant. Um, and again, this was approved in 2018. It's pretty much... 199, 98% CBD cannabidiol, that non-intoxicating component of the cannabis plant. And it's been approved for three rare forms of epilepsy or seizure disorders, and it's not scheduled. Um, so it's off the Controlled Substances Act entirely, which helps or increases the flexibility for prescribing. There have been some studies using this particular drug or with other types of cannabidiol to understand its potential effects for pain as well as anxiety. But again, keep in mind that those of you who have been to dispensaries and are, have looked at cannabidiol products, you'll note that usually the doses of cannabidiol in these products, you know, at most there might be 50 milligrams in a dose or maybe even 100 milligrams in a dose. Usually it's, they're much smaller doses. The placebo controlled studies with this CBD have been high the effectiveness of the CBD has been shown with over 300 milligrams of CBD per dose. Um, so the point is here is that what we know about CBD and its effectiveness from placebo controlled studies is based off of doses that are much higher than what are typically found in dispensaries. There's one other drug I wanna tell you about, and this one is not FDA approved. Um, this one is approved in Europe and Israel and Canada, and it's also plant derived. And it's a combination of CBD and THC. And a lot of the studies, actually, I think all of the studies that have looked at the use of cannabis and cannabinoids for cancer pain have used this particular drug called Sativex. It is not available in the United States. And in fact, it's considered schedule one. So it's on part on par with cannabis itself, with LSD, um, you know, with, with heroin. Um, but again, this, this drug has been shown in some trials actually in the United States, despite the fact that it's schedule one, this drug has been shown to be helpful for cancer pain, specifically in low doses. For instance, one study found that only one to four sprays of this drug, which has two and a half milligrams of THC, is helpful for cancer pain. So that's equivalent to about 10 milligrams of THC in a day. But when you start increasing the dose, patients do not show the same type of pain suppression. So that study demonstrated that you just don't need that much of it. You don't need that much THC to actually have a reduction in pain for cancer pain. And so that study was really important. So again, just as a reminder, there are four major drugs that have been utilized in trying to determine if cannabis is helpful for cancer symptomatology and other types of indications. Dronabinol is that synthetic THC. Nabilone is that synthetic drug that's very much like THC. Epidiolex is that plant-derived CBD. And then Sativex, which is not FDA approved but it's a combination of the THC and CBD together. Now, some investigational studies um, have looked at inhaled cannabis. Um, and these are few and far between. They're done, um, there've been some done in Europe. And in fact, a couple have just been published from Israel. 
And actually, the United States has quite a few studies. There are about 10 studies, if not more, looking at inhaled cannabis in patient populations. So how, how is this studied? You know, cannabis is, is schedule one. How do you have patients smoke or, you know, what, what are they doing in these studies? And so what you see here on the left is a canister of these cannabis cigarettes that these researchers, including myself, we obtain from the government. There's only one source in the United States where we can get our cannabis from. And when we get our cannabis, this is what it looks like. They are, I will say they're, they're uniform, very nicely rolled uh, cannabis cigarettes. They have about a gram of cannabis in each one. And they range in the amount of THC from one to 15%. The studies that have been done that I've been talking about have been done with pretty low THC content, about up to 6% THC. Now that farm, the one farm that we can get cannabis from has a lot of different types of cannabis. So we can actually get cannabis with almost all CBD or we can get cannabis with THC and CBD in it. So the number of varieties of cannabis products that we can test from this one farm is increasing. Because cannabis smoking, there's issues with it, especially if you're looking at cancer patients, there's a concern that a lot of cancer patients have where they don't wanna smoke their investigational medicine. So in 2007, there was a movement to start looking at vaporizing. So instead of having patients smoke, could they vaporize it and still get the same effect? And those studies in 2007 really um, opened up a range of possibilities. And so things moved from using this bulky um, vaporizer that you can see in the middle to a handheld vaporizing device that vaporizes plant material that you can see all the way in the right. So there are a number of studies looking at vaporized cannabis and we're doing some of them at UCLA as well. So to summarize, there have actually been few placebo controlled studies with cannabis. Most studies have looked at THC, the synthetic THC or THC like drug. And there've also been those studies with that spray with the THC and CBD combination. There are four FDA approved cannabinoid based medications. A lot of people don't realize that. And three of them are approved for cancer related symptoms. Um, so that's really important to understand. In the history of cannabis and cannabinoid therapeutics, the first indications that were approved for a cannabinoid in the United States were for cancer-related symptoms. With respect to effective doses, how do we map on to the FDA-approved doses to what is available in dispensaries? And that's difficult given that there are variances between the doses that are available in dispensaries and the doses that are provided with these clinical grade, pharmaceutical grade um, drugs. Now, what about the anti-tumor effects of cannabis? You'll see that I've, I've left that off from the previous slides. And in part, you'll see that there's just not that much data here. There's really nice data in cell and animal studies demonstrating that cannabis and cannabinoids, specifically THC and CBD, might help to mitigate the um, induction of, or I'm sorry, they, it might help to improve the induction of cancer cell death. It might help to blockade uh, cancer cell proliferation, impair tumor angiogenesis, and inhibit cancer cell migration and metastasis. And another interesting thing to note is that in some of these studies, they've demonstrated that THC and CBD can act together with anti-cancer drugs to improve the uh, therapeutic outcomes, again, in animals. And in these studies, the animals, it, it seems like these drugs are safe um, and effective. Now, what do we know about this in humans? There was a case series report published with patients that were using CBD, and it seemed like there was a clinical response in the patients that were using CBD. So this provides a some window of evidence that perhaps CBD might be helpful. Um, there was a really interesting study where they did intracranial THC administration 
in nine glioblastoma patients. So they were administering THC almost directly to the tumor. And what they found was that it was safe, THC was safe, and there were decreased markers of malignancy. But keep in mind that there wasn't a placebo control group um, in this study, but it, was, uh, it gave a window into the potential of THC for glioblastoma. Now, I wanna share an important update with you. I put these slides together a couple of days, and when I was putting them together, there's a study that's very well known about how there was a placebo-controlled trial with glioblastoma patients, and THC, the combination of THC and CBD improved survival rate. But the study hadn't been published. We knew about the abstract. It had been presented at a conference. The study hadn't been published. Two days ago, the study was published, and they're really impressive findings. And this really um, brings, the, brings the field forward. So I look forward to, to sharing that with you. Um, there are also two studies with THC and CBD underway. Now, what about specific to pancreatic cancer? In animal studies, it's been shown that THC and CBD can suppress pancreatic cancer cell growth. Um, and also THC and CBD can inhibit proliferation of pancreatic cancer cells. And what I have here is a, um, a, a photo of what happens to the tumor size and the tumor weight in animals that have been treated with THC and CBD on the bottom, so with drug, versus those that have not been treated with, with drug. And what you can see without even having to weigh these tumors, you can see visually, that the tumor size is significantly smaller if, in the animals that have been given CBD and THC. So have these studies been translated yet to humans? Unfortunately, no. As of now, there have no, been no studies looking at the anti-tumor effects of cannabinoids in pancreatic cancer. So again, we have some really nice data looking at the effects of cannabis and cannabinoids for cancer symptomology but very little is known about cannabinoids and cancer and tumor growth in people yet. So some patient considerations that are important to think about. So here, I usually talk about the adverse effects of cannabis and cannabinoids, but they're not necessarily all applicable to cancer patients. For instance, people who smoke cannabis are known to, there's a known association between bronchitis and cannabis smoking, a risk of vehicle crashes, low birth weight in women who are pregnant and are using cannabis while they're pregnant. So those aren't necessarily related to this population. Um, it is important, like I said before, that THC is associated with impaired learning, memory and attention, dizziness and falls, specifically in older populations, THC is associated with this. And importantly, there's a known drug-drug interaction between these chemicals, the cannabinoids, as well as um, prescribed medications that people use, including immunotherapy and chemotherapeutics. So that's really important to note. There are some mental health issues associated with cannabis and cannabinoids that people should be aware of. For instance, there's an association between acute psychosis when sometimes people use cannabis, anxiety, people in the audience might have experienced using cannabis or THC and feeling anxious, as well as a recent report showing that in medical cannabis patients, they report a fraction of that population do report that they have withdrawal symptoms when they stop using it. And so that's just important to keep in mind. Another important thing to keep in mind harkens back to what I was talking about originally earlier on is that what's in the bottle? Not necessarily what are the adverse effects of what is in the bottle, but can you be certain that what's on the label is an accurate reflection of what's in the bottle? So when thinking about the use of cannabis and cannabinoids as a cancer patient, you know, it's important to consult your physician, let them know what you're thinking about, especially with respect to these drug-drug interactions, and they should be able to talk to you about that. Um, it's important to think about the regulated versus unregulated products. So how do you know that a dispensary that you're going into is regulated? And this is a question that we get frequently. In the state of California, the California Bureau of Cannabis Control actually has a website and you can go to that website and you can put in the dispensary and you can find out if it's a regulated dispensary. 
And one of the reasons, again, why this is important is because all the products that are in that regulated dispensary have to adhere to the California state standards with respect to the quality control, and that's important. Product integrity, it's important whether you're in California, the US, or any part of the globe. You want to make sure that, again, not you, but in general, that what's on the label is actually, in fact, what's in the product. And one way that you can do this, or one way that an informed patient can do this, is by looking to see if that product has something called a certificate of an analysis. Certificate of analysis. And what a certificate of analysis tells you, and this is an example of one, a certificate of analysis tells you that this product has been tested, that this product has this amount of THC, this amount of CBD, this amount of other types of cannabinoids. It might also tell you if there's heavy metals or pesticides. So a certificate of analysis is important. Now the United States, um, we don't have any guidelines with respect to how to use cannabis. Um, none of the medical associations have come out with guidelines. So, you know, thinking about where do you get guidance from? Where does a patient get guidance from? It's, it's really difficult to, to know. It's, it's not federally regulated. Doctors might not know. And so it's complicated. But if you look to other countries, for example, Canada, where they legalized cannabis a couple of years ago, they actually put out guidelines for patients. And so you might have heard of this one, start low, go slow. And if you go to Health Canada's website, they have guidelines so that a patient can know how to lower their risk. And this is just the government's acknowledgement that patients and people are using these products and how can risk be lowered. Um, so this is a, a graphical this description of their um, lower risk guidelines, which are interesting to know um, with respect to patient consideration. So why so few studies? I've been telling you a lot about the potential future of what we can think about from animal studies and how cannabis and cannabinoids might help cancer patients. And yet we've been doing this work, you know, since for hundreds of years, right? People have been interested in this. And so why do we have so few randomized placebo controlled studies? And I'll just give you a taste of some of these barriers. And the first of course, is the fact that cannabis is schedule one. So that is definitely a barrier to this research. It's very hard to surmount some of these regulatory hurdles. Very few people do it. We're lucky at UCLA, we've been able to do it. We've worked hard to do it so that we can actually study this drug and constituents of the drug. Another issue is that there are very few products that are available that meet the FDA standards. So whenever I do a study and I give a drug to a human being, I have to demonstrate that that drug does not have pesticides, does not have mold, does not um, um, have heavy metals, or if it's synthetic, that I can say, I know what is in this drug. I know that it is stable and that it's consistent from batch to batch. And that's expensive to produce. So the, the cannabis products in dispensaries don't necessarily adhere to those standards because it's very expensive to meet those standards. So we have very few products available for us to study. And of course, the last barrier is the fact that getting funding for these studies is very challenging. So how are we filling the gaps in knowledge? So at UCLA, we are hopeful. We are hopeful that we are going to be able to reach this large gap in knowledge. So we have this UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative, which I'm very excited to share with you. It started in 2017. The goals of this initiative it's multidisciplinary. It brings investigators from across the campus. We have legal scholars. We have people in sociology, political science. We have oncologists. We have neuroscientists. And we all come together to talk about the most pressing issues and to figure out how we can move research forward. And we also educate. We have undergrad courses. We produce seminars to be able to disseminate our findings. And lastly, we have this very unique cannabis and cannabinoid research laboratory where we can actually give these drugs to people, patients and healthy individuals to understand the effects of the plant and its constituents. And so I'll just share with you some things that we're looking at that are related to cancer symptomatology. 
We're looking at CBD and THC under controlled conditions, placebo versus CBD, placebo versus THC, to decrease pain as well to decrease the need for opioids. Those terpenes that I was talking about in the, in the beginning, beta caryophylline and myrcene, we're looking at those and their ability to decrease pain. CBG, that cannabinoid that I was talking about earlier that's never been given to a human. We just got funding to look at CBG and understand its effects to be able to reduce pain and increase appetite. And we have several other studies. We're interested in differences between men and women, aging, sleep, anxiety, and substance use. So to conclude, cannabis and cannabinoids hold promise for many symptoms related to cancer, pain, nausea, anxiety, appetite, sleep. And it's really important um, that we have dialogue about the unknowns with physicians, and we also continue educating to ensure safety and to minimize adverse effects. And if you want to learn more, please get in touch with us, um, cannabis at mennet.ucla.edu. We're on Twitter. And I'd like to thank my colleagues at UCLA, my mentors and mentors at Columbia and a mentor and very dear friend, um, Dr. Donald Abrams, uh, who's an integrative oncologist, who's a pioneer in this field. So thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to answering some of your questions. Dr. Cooper, what an excellent presentation. Thank you so, so much. Um, the subject is so important to all of us at the Hirschberg Foundation and to help the cancer patients with any of these symptoms. Um, so these studies, it's important for us to, to speak with you and, and be up to date on what's happening. Um, we do have some questions that came in via registration. Um, let me start with a couple of those. And, and then we, any of you wanna uh, write in the chat any of your questions or raise your hand and we'll get to you. Um, the first is uh, Stephen asks, uh, what's better, synthetic or mother nature? So that's a question that's top of mind. A lot of people think that mother nature is superior to synthetic because when you have mother nature, you can have all these different constituents that work together. Now the question is, are they actually working together to produce a optimal therapeutic response? And the answer is that we really don't know yet. And this is something that we're looking at at UCLA with looking at these terpenes and these minor cannabinoids and seeing how they work together. I will say that I think what's best is what's been studied, right? So whatever product that we have the most information on, I think in my humble view is what's best. We know the potential effectiveness at what dose, at what mode of administration, and what are some of the adverse effects that you have to be mindful of. Great, thank you. Um, another question, uh, Mark um, mentions, how do we start progressing trials with large combination of drugs, including non-toxic anti-cancer natural compounds like quercetin, curcumin, high dose vitamin C? Etc. Yeah, and um, this goes back to that question about the whole plant and the constituents working together. So similarly, you know, how do we design studies where we can look at a combination of all these therapeutics that are out there, like curcumin um, and vitamin C, and be able to understand its impact when they're put together? And you know, my my training is, a, is as a pharmacologist, and so. I get very hung up on understanding what each individual component does by itself and then looking at what they do together. One thing that's interesting that we're learning is that, you know, we know that some drugs work together, not just by addition. So it's not just one plus one equals two, but sometimes it's one plus one equals five. So you, you might have that synergistic effect or you might have, you know, an impact that's adverse, that's negative. For instance, if one drug impacts the metabolism of another drug and that drug becomes, gets to toxic levels, you know, in the bloodstream. So it's painful and it's long and it requires funding, but understanding these constituents and how they act separately and then together, I think is really the only way that we can get a holistic sense of a safe and effective combination of products that can be used for specific indications. 
Great. And uh, Margarita is asking, did you did you say you have a mentor in Columbia and is it in South America? I'm sorry, it's Columbia University. I actually, I just came to UCLA two years ago um, and I was uh, mentored for about, you know, when I first started getting into the cannabis world, it was at Columbia University. So I apologize for not for not clarifying the Columbia University. Also, and, and I had a question about this as well. Rick asked, what happened between 1900 when cannabis products were widely accepted and used and later in the century uh, when it became a banned schedule one substance? And if you can also say where we are today on that, because I know a lot's been going on. Right, so they had these acts. It, it was really the Controlled Substance Act that put it on the schedule one. But in, I think it was 1969, the UN, uh, put out the international treaty where essentially it banned cannabis as well, certain parts of cannabis. Um, so there was an international movement as well. And I am definitely not a scholar in the, his in the history of this um, as to what happened between 1936 and mm -hmm. 1970. But essentially it was, it was really banned for use and it was banned for study. And I'm, I'm not sure to what level it was. Um, but now, you know, we have tremendous interest in this drug and people tend to think that the US is particularly hampered by the regulatory status. I will say that other countries are as well. And even in countries like Canada where cannabis is legal, researchers there still have a really hard time. They have a hard time getting access to drugs that can be used for clinical trials, similar to what I was talking about before. And because the cost, the funding is really hard. We are lucky in the United States, actually, that we have the NIH and the, NI, the NIH, even though it's very challenging to get a grant, but when you do get a grant, the budgets are fairly large. Um, so that's really nice. And that's different than in some other, com some other countries. Um, but there are, there are quite a few barriers to this research and you have to have, you have to be stubborn. Um, you have to not, say no and be able to just stick with it and get through that paperwork and it is painful and it is not necessarily scientifically gratifying until the end you work your tail off to get a study funded for two years you work your tail off to get all the regulatory approvals for two years you do the study four years later you have the results and then it's amazing and it's worth it it is worth it but it is hard work it's hard also, are you aware of any European-based institutions researching cannabis in a similar manner to what you were doing at UCLA? So I, there are European institutions that do this, um, as well as, you know, there are institutions in the United States. I think at UCLA, what sets us apart um, is that we're, I think that we're lucky because it's such a large institution with so many experts in diverse fields who are really interested in this topic. So when I came to Los Angeles and I was driving down Sunset Boulevard to get to UCLA, seeing the billboards, the cannabis billboards, hearing from physicians about their patients who are using cannabis and the physicians being frustrated because they don't know what information to give their patients, there is a broad interest and engagement and enthusiasm to tackle this problem here in Los Angeles because it is a booming industry. So many people are using these products and it, it talk about, a, you know, a, a public health issue. It is, I think it's more pressing here than let's say where I was in New York. It just wasn't, it was prevalent. Cannabis use was prevalent in New York, but not the same way that it is here. And that has really surged interest and enthusiasm to do this work and to be able to stick with it, you know, to work through the year long need for meeting the regulatory standards. Because I think that in a lot of places, researchers would, would just be like, you know what, it's just too much of a hassle. I'm not going to do it. Um, so there is a certain enthusiasm and interest at UCLA that I don't know all the other, you know, centers around the world, but I can say that, that from my experience, UCLA is quite unique. Got it. And, and uh, hi, Ryan and Rebecca. Um, uh, they've been finding that a high ratio of CBD to THC, like seven to one or higher, will minimize the psychotropic effects of the THC. And what is your experience with that? 
So I can just say from a pharmacologist perspective is that we know that CBD isn't intoxicating. We know that THC is intoxicating. So people talk a lot about these ratios, the one to one, the one to five, the one to 20. What I care most about is the milligrams. What is the actual dose that you're taking? Not the ratio, but the actual dose, right? And so that's really important to look at. So if you're taking a one to 10 ratio of THC to CBD, and the amount of THC in there is 0.5 milligrams, then yeah, you're not, from my experience, you're not gonna feel any intoxicating effects from that very small amount of THC. And it's possible that CBD might be, might, might be helpful with anxiety in that, in that circumstance. That dose of CBD hasn't yet been studied for anxiety, but it might be, we don't know. The studies haven't been done yet. But yes, um, tinkering around with the THC and CBD doses, there are going to be variations in effect. And I really think that it's about the actual dose. We don't know so much about if the, how much the ratios matter. It's really about the dose. At least I would say that, that's my hypothesis. Great, um, another question. I, I don't, uh, Rick asks, I don't understand the laws. How are the 80% unregulated dispensaries allowed to be open? Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> there's unregulated cannabis businesses throughout the United States before, I mean, you know, you can think about what, what um, the cannabis business was like before we had these regulations in place. And, you know, a lot of these unregulated dispensaries they can go under the radar. Um, so, you know, they're not necessarily, sometimes they're getting hammered with fines or being shut down. Um, I don't know if you saw in Canada, the, some unregulated dispensaries, this is <laughs> so Canadian. They put, <laughs> the, the Canadian law enforcement, they place bricks in front of the unregulated dispensary so people couldn't go in and out. Like that was their solution. It was, a, I mean, it was a good solution. You really couldn't get access to the unregulated dispensary then. Um, but so I don't know what the rates are for, you know, having the unregulated dispensary shut down or fine. But I do know that, that it is a really big issue and that people don't know that there's a difference between the unregulated and regulated dispensaries in Los Angeles. All right, and speaking of Canada, Sandy asks, um, uh, I live in Canada and upon my diagnosis of stage three pancreatic cancer, I was prescribed Nabilone by my uh, general practitioner for chemo-induced nausea. I don't know if it was that or the good anti-nausea med I was prescribed, but I had no nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, et cetera. I recently had Mets to liver, so now stage four. Uh, so would you uh, like, so the, the, interested in looking into uh, Sativex. What are your thoughts? Also, many people with pancreatic cancer have tried Rick Simpson oil. What are your thoughts on that and effectiveness side effects? Thank you. Wow. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that story. And I'm sorry to hear that you're, that you're struggling now. Um, uh, I was concentrating more on that than the actual question, actually. Um, so the question is, it sounds like Nablone was really helpful for you. Um, I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not a physician, but based on my in, own intuition, it, it seems like if Nablone was helpful, I know that there are some cost concerns with Nablone, um, at least there are in the United States. Uh, if Nablone was helpful, it seems like it might, it might be worth just going with it. But again, I, I think it's important to talk to your physician about that. Um, um, and with respect to the Rick Simpson's oil, you know, it's interesting um, understanding how CBD might be helpful uh, for these indications. And a lot of people are reporting the success. I, I think that a lot of our research usually stems from what we see in animal studies. I think in this space with cannabis and cannabinoids, a lot of the research where we're looking at placebo versus medication I think a lot of it is really driven by patient self-report. And so when we're hearing that people are reporting phenomenal success with one type of product, then immediately that starts to beg the question and also a re real relevant public health issue. Like we got to study this. This many people are using it for this indication. It is really important to study this 
product or something like this product that the FDA is okay with us studying for these different types of symptoms. And so it's, it's really important that we keep on getting those reports from patients. What are their experiences? What are they finding? Um, because, you know, it's very difficult for us to, to talk to a rat in that situation. And, you know, the person experience is really the most valuable for us. Great. Um, a couple more questions. Um, Rick's asking, what are the shortcomings of using or studying synthetic THC CBD products? Isn't a molecule a molecule? Yeah, right. So indeed, um, a molecule is a molecule. The advantage that some people think the plant has is that you might be looking at other constituents along with the THC and the CBD. So when you're looking at just the synthetic version, you're only getting the THC and the CBD, you're not getting these other constituents that are in the plant. And so some people think the advantage of looking at the plant THC and CBD is that you get these other constituents that might be helpful. Great. Um, in one slide, you mentioned a positive synergistic relationship between anti-cancer medications and THC, CBD. And in another, you mentioned an adverse effect between these and chemotherapy. Could you elaborate a little, Ryan asks. I can elaborate a little. I can say that, you know, there have been one or two publications that have looked at the interaction between these drugs in people while they are using chemotherapeutic agents. Um, and I remember there was one of note last year that showed concerning changes in the levels of the chemotherapeutic agents. Um, a recent study out of Israel showed that there wasn't an impact on CBD on the chemotherapeutic agent. So that was a relief, but it is something to keep in mind um, because you don't necessarily want to mess with those blood levels of your chemotherapeutic agents. And the issue is, is that again, when you do these studies, you know, placebo controlled study where you're doing a very rigorous procedure, you can actually look at blood levels. I mean, that's one of the, one of the aspects of doing these studies is you want to make sure that there isn't these drug drug interactions. And it's something to, to consider um, as a patient and as a physician who's treating the patient. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Um, Aggie, it's uh, 2.10. Uh, we, okay. if any questions we didn't get to, we will, we will, uh, we're gonna continue with CyberChat. You're welcome to stay on. Um, first of all, Ziva, this was an overwhelming presentation. I'm sure everybody's um, very grateful and somewhat confused <laughs> because I think the biggest question would be, um, what medical advisor can I go to that can lead me into the right direction? So I, I do wanna say that we do have a, 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 one doctor that we are in contact with in the Santa Monica area um, th that we can recommend, but there should be 50 of them in Los Angeles. So, so it's, 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 it's kind of, it's, frustrating, but bless you for giving us an hour, <laughs> more than an hour of talking. And uh, uh, we really, truly appreciate it. And I know everybody learned.